Welcome to another SCLC Today program, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We took a vacation break, um, been to D.C. with our family reunion, had other speaking engagements. But ladies and gentlemen, we are here, and thank you for tuning in. You know, in the last uh, uh, week, week and a half, we lost a very good soldier in the civil rights movement, great leader in his own right, Reverend James Lawson, who was very close to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I've been knowing uh, Reverend Lawson, uh, we call him Jim Lawson, and for many of years. I, I admired his leadership. Uh, he lived in Los Angeles uh, for most of his adult life. Also was a professor at Vanderbilt University, and he worked with Dr. Bernard Lafayette as well, uh, our uh, chairman of the board. And uh, Reverend James Lawson inspired Dr. King. He the one uh, after the passing of Dr. King, when many many people would ask the question, "Why was Dr. King assassinated?" What caused this government and others of adversarial thinking to try and eliminate this man? Why, why, why was the government so anti-Kenyan philosophy? But it was Reverend Jane Lawson who brought, along with some others, but he initiated the Kenyan philosophy in terms of, of, of nonviolence in talking and training and convincing Dr. King that this is the philosophy that SCRC should take on. Uh, Reverend Jane Lawson was a, a person of commitment in terms of nonviolence in demonstration and protest. And Dr. King was very respectful and very committed to work with Reverend Lawson. You know, I, I, I listened to one of the speeches Dr. King gave just the night before, before he was assassinated, and he was complimenting Jim Lawson. He said, I just want to thank Jim Lawson, Reverend Jim Lawson, he said, Reverend Jim Lawson for the work that he has done in nonviolence and being here tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. That was very touching to me. So I just want to say in, in his transition of going home, uh, he left an imprint, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of the civil rights movement and just the human rights of people being respected and being treated with the utmost of opportunities in terms of life in the institution of the Kenyan philosophy. Uh, Reverend Lawson said himself when the question was asked, why was Dr. King assassinated? He was the one who researched and came back with the answer. He said Dr. King was assassinated for two reasons. One was his opposition to the Vietnam War, and number two, the Poor People Campaign. Those were the two reasons that Dr. King was assassinated. And it was documented by none other than the late Reverend James Lawson, who passed just over a week ago in terms of his expertise on civil rights in the fight for dignity and quality for all God's children. Dr. King forgot about the economics, as Jim Lawson said. I was in California just about a year ago and called him, and we talked on the phone. Uh, always inspiring and enlightening to me. We talked at least two or three times a year. And he would set you on fire with the facts. And he's saying about the economics. That's why Dr. King brought about the Poor People Campaign. And his opposition to the Vietnam War. That's why Reverend James Lawson uh, was such a significant role and historian in terms of his life. He knew the history, and he told the truth. We're going to miss this great leader, and I just want to convey our condolences from SCLC 
to the family and to all the people of the world who knew and loved and respected this man. All the national news carried his passing. We had a passing, uh, another great leader in his own right, Reverend Fred Taylor, uh, just over a week ago. Reverend Fred Taylor, who was a personal friend and leader in his own right in, in the civil rights movement. Everybody knew Reverend Fred Taylor. And Reverend Fred Taylor, I, I was telling this story to someone just the other day. It was Reverend Fred Taylor who came with uh, Ralph Warrell and uh, Fred Taylor uh, to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. When I first ran for public office, I ran for city council. And it was very, very hot that voting day. But it was Reverend Fred Taylor, uh, along with Frederick Moore, who has passed as well, and Ralph Warrell, who has passed. All three of them had gone home to be with the Lord. And they came and just stayed in that hot sun, motivating and passing out leaflets and going around Tuscaloosa to tell people to vote for me. And I just want to thank Reverend Fred Taylor in the spirit of what he represented. Reverend Fred Taylor led many of marches, sung many of songs, but we will have his spirit. And when he was saying, shine on me, let the spirit of the Lord shine on me. Let me see the light. That was Reverend Fred Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. He was a ground crew perfectionist. He was a man who carried the megaphone. He was a man who led the movement from Selma uh, in the reenactment. He and Reverend James Owens and Ralph Warrell, Fred Moore, they all gone. But it was Reverend Fred Taylor who had that megaphone and would come out with, I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. Just want to pass those two great leaders in their conveyance of transition to expose the historicity of what they represented. And many of people say, oh, folks have forgot about the movement. It's the movement that will forever live because what you are doing today is because they gave their lives and their sacrifice to do what many others would not do. And the supreme sacrifice, they presented their lives to the forefront in the front line of the movement. Thank you, Reverend Fred Taylor. Thank you, Reverend James Lawson, for all that you have done and for many others who are seriously committed to continue this fight because we must keep on marching in a nonviolent faction. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about Mr. Status Dawson, Founder. He was on this program about a month ago. Uh, uh, Mr. Dawson was here giving us good information. He's the founder of 10,000 Minority Appraisers Foundation. He, he, he's the founder of that. Very committed. And, and, and I noticed the concerns about appraisers. It's a good old boy uh, network to a large degree. But I never see any minorities or black people or African-Americans in that field alone the way. And as we were talking earlier, you know, the appraisers are the ones who really keep the documentations and all of the uh, intellectual properties on the forestries throughout our country. That's very important. And they are trained to do so. But there are no minorities. There are no blacks. There are no people of color that's involved. But because of Mr. Dawson, that is Dawson, we have the Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Labor, uh, an apprenticeship training program that's, that's, that's been ceremonious talked about, but it came to reality just a few days ago in Washington, D.C., with the signing of the apprenticeship training program through the U.S. Department of Labor. Ladies and gentlemen, a very low percentage of blacks 
and minorities in this appraisal business. And our camera was there when they had the agreement between uh, Mr. Dawson and the 10,000 Minority Appraiser Foundation. The U.S. Department of Labor was there to support them so we can enhance other opportunities for people of color. Listen and see what we're going to present to you at this particular time. It was an historic moment in the world of real estate appraisals as the 10,000 Minority Appraisers Foundation received National Apprenticeship Training Certification from the United States Department of Labor, a landmark achievement in the mission to promote diversity, equity, and excellence in property valuation. John Ladd, Administrator for the Department of Labor Apprenticeship Program, sees this certification as a significant step towards creating a more inclusive workforce. We are about to sign uh, national program standards of apprenticeship and so for those of you who haven't been in the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, work of, of developing these standards you know these are a big deal uh, it's really exciting when we're able to uh, register a national program of apprenticeship uh, by by being a national program that means you are registered and which is certified to operate anywhere in the country um, and so you know it carries a lot of stature and carries a lot of weight Thaddeus Dawson, founder of 10,000 Minority Appraisers Foundation, discovered shortcomings in the appraisal process was not just a minority problem, it was an American problem. So when I started, we were advocating for black people and the disparity in property values and the wealth gap, which uh, was 150 to $200 billion. But as we started to tour the country, recognized and found that it was an America problem, not just a black problem. So the uh, Native Americans and the federal government lose trillions of dollars due to outdated fee schedules and, and not being able to update appraisals because there's not enough appraisers to actually do the work. We will be able to train the next generation to be able to put out reliable numbers which will have a total impact on America as a whole in city, county, state, and federal agencies to be able to replace an aging workforce with a, a successful plan. George Dell, data scientist, economist, and teacher, assures us that delivering data-driven results removes the long history of bias in the appraisal industry. And we basically teach the evidence-based valuation, data-oriented methods, um, which basically re replace the theory of appraisal that goes 80, 60, and 80 years old and has had minimal changes and it's created the culture that uh, enables the bias. Over the last 20, 30 years, as data became available, instead of gathering and scraping together four or five comps, we pick comps in 10 seconds. Go doop, 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 doop. And there's where the analytic bias comes from. If you look at the black-white wealth gap, the white median wealth is 284,000, black wealth is 44,000, What's the difference? A house. A house. A house explains that entire difference. So Nationally renowned economist Bill Cunningham has confidence in the 10,000 minority appraisers' vision. Itself. I mean, anytime you can't really depend upon the, the market marks, what a market is telling you is the value of some asset for whatever reason, be it because of, of racism or discrimination or be geography and some, you know, that throws markets off. So to the extent that you can solve that, markets get better at doing what markets are supposed to do, which is to accurately value assets. And we've known for centuries that discrimination has gotten in the way of markets working the way that they should. And this is one effort that will help everybody. Help markets work better, help everybody out. Personal property owners and the United States Forest Service rely on accurate and timely appraisals. You know, across the nation, when we start to look at um, appraising, we start to look at you know homes, or we start to look at uh, what we have out in terms of uh, on the national space, um, it's, it's 193 million acres that we have within the Forest Service. And when we go out to assess properties, to do rights away, to do easements, to do land exchanges, we need an appraisal. 
The 10,000 Minority Appraisers Foundation is not just changing the appraisal industry. It's shaping a future where every community is valued accurately and fairly. Join us in celebrating this milestone and supporting the continued efforts to build a more equitable and prosperous society for all.